seems to go against all medical ethics when you're supposed to do no harm and somehow we now explain that killing that patient, physician-assisted suicide, is somehow different. Medically-assisted suicide and euthanasia. The practice is growing at an alarming rate in Canada. We talked to two leaders in the fight against assisted suicide laws. Synodality is the movement of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit unites together the entire body of Christ. Uniting all members of the Catholic Church in the mission of the Church. A look ahead at the Synod on Synodality happening next month in the Vatican. People need to know that refugees, uh, when they leave their home country, um, you know, all they want is a, a safe place for their families. The Pope focuses again on the immigrant, his trip to the Mediterranean, and his message to embrace the stranger. And the secrets of Fatima. We explore mysteries of the church with the nun guiding the cause of sainthood for the venerable Sister Lucia. EWTN News In Depth starts now. When doctors or when employees at Veterans Affairs Canada put suicide on the table as a way out, then they sharply send the message to the sufferer that maybe their life is not worth living. Euthanasia and assisted suicide in Canada. Member of Parliament Garnet Jenis urged the House of Commons earlier this year to suspend the law aiming to expand the practice to people suffering with mental illness. The law was paused for one year, a small win for the pro-life movement. But that window is quickly closing, as euthanasia and medically-assisted suicide will be available to people with mental illness in March of 2024. As EWTN News In-Depth reported to you over the summer, these procedures are becoming more culturally accepted and legalized around the globe. But Canada seems to now be leading the charge, with some of the most permissive euthanasia laws in the world being used there at an alarming rate. Euthanasia is legal in all of the countries highlighted in green, including the Netherlands, where they are looking to expand euthanasia to use on children. The New South Wales region of Australia will officially legalize it this November. Medically assisted suicide is legal in all the areas highlighted in purple. And in Italy, it is not legal by any legislation. It is only decided by the courts on a case-by-case -case basis. And in Germany, Parliament recently failed to agree on an assisted suicide law. Euthanasia is illegal in Germany, as it was used by the Nazis to kill more than 200,000 people with physical and mental disabilities. In Canada, they call euthanasia medical assistance in dying, or for short, MAID. Canada first legalized assisted suicide in June 2016 for adults suffering from irreversible deadly illnesses and whose death was reasonably foreseeable. Changes to the law in 2021 relaxed rules for MAID, the requirement for the patient to give final consent immediately before the procedure was dropped. That is intended to ensure someone approved for euthanasia can still get it if they lose mental capacity before it's carried out. The new guidelines also removed the requirement for a person's natural death to be reasonably foreseeable. The changes also expanded access, instead of only those with a terminal illness, to those with a serious and incurable illness where the patient says their suffering is intolerable. Since 2016, more than 30,000 Canadians have used the country's assisted suicide law to end their own lives. The numbers have steadily risen since its inception. The most recent reports indicate a major jump from 7,400 deaths in 2020 up to 10,000 in 2021. That's an increase of more than 34 percent. The official numbers for 2022 have not been released yet, but the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition estimates more than 13,000 deaths associated with medically assisted suicide laws in Canada took place last year. There are multiple organizations that are advocating for euthanasia, including one called Dying with Dignity. I had an experience with accompanying a family member uh, on her journey in assisted dying. One of the things that has come out, I think, uh, in the last few years is the therapeutic value of individuals being advised that they are eligible for an assisted death. We all want the luxury of, of, a, of a good death. I think, unfortunately, I would count myself uh, amongst a group of Canadians that have unfortunately had the experience with a bad death. It's, it's critically important and fundamentally to, to Canadian to realize that 
uh, it is your choice. It's your life and it's your choice. Dying with Dignity Canada labels itself a human rights charity. The organization provides step-by-step -step guides on how to request and access medically assisted suicide. It also holds webinars, talks, events, and petitions parliament to expand access to euthanasia in Canada. The College of Physicians of Quebec, or CMQ, also supports the medical aid in dying laws, most recently calling for the expansion of MAID to severely disabled people. The region of Quebec stands out in Canada, leading the nation in people who have received assisted suicide. Projections from Quebec's Commission on End-of-Life Care says Quebec may finish this year with 7% of all deaths there from physician-assisted suicide. Commission President Dr. Michel Bureau says that's three times more than Belgium, where it has been legal for more than 20 years. In a recent letter to doctors, he warned them to stick to the law, citing 15 cases where doctors may have violated the guidelines. And we're joined by two people who know this subject very well. Amanda Actman is founder of the Dying to Meet You Project. And Peter Stockland, the publisher and editor of Catholic Register in Canada, has years of reporting on the evolution of medical aid and dying laws. Peter, how did Canada get here? What happened over the course of the last 15 years? Real short uh, snapshot. I've been watching this uh, unfold for, well, since the early 90s. In uh, There was a... Uh, Supreme Court decision called Rodriguez, which actually upheld the existing uh, uh, anti-euthanasia, anti-assisted suicide law. Um, and so it, there was a kind of slow creep for, for a, a decade or so. And then the, the um, forces, a dying with dignity group and, and, and a pro-euthanasia, pro pro-made, as we now call it, forces really, really began to get traction. And in 2015, the Supreme Court reversed itself and said that the law was not, in fact, constitutional. And that absolutely opened the floodgates. There was legislation passed in 2016. And, you know, I was at uh, a series of follow-up um, uh, events when that, uh, when the, after that legislation was passed. And you could tell um, then that the, the ink wasn't even dry on the legislation and the, the pro-made, pro-euthanasia forces were out in force, just pushing, pushing, pushing to have it expanded. And um, in 2021, there, were, there was, uh, right in the, in the, the heat of, of COVID, there was another effort to expand it, which, which uh, further weakened what, whatever uh, what, uh, legislation was in place. And now we're at a point where a year from now, we're going to be um, giving MAID to mentally ill people. There was that would actually be the case now, but um, but there was such a pushback to it that that the, the federal government introduced legislation uh, stalling that 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 for a year. So we've gone in the in the space of my working life from a, a constitutional uh, agreement that made was was could be legally regis, uh, legislated against to uh, the simple as I say the floodgates open. And there are cultural issues at stake here, too. Amanda, we just watched snippets of some pro-euthanasia videos in Canada. What impact are they having on the culture, these messages, that, uh, that euthanasia is a good thing? The, the organization Dying With Dignity starts by talking about how their goal is to remove unwanted suffering. And since most suffering is unwanted, they have found a lot of resonance with that. Suffering is a mystery. Suffering is not simple or easy or uh, something that we're, we're ready-made to contend with. That's why it's so important that we who are pro-life put out a positive, proactive message to counter these, that there is a better way that can face up the mystery of suffering, not with solutions, but with accompaniment. And until we put forward a more alternative, a more beautiful alternative vision, those other messages might they continue to gain resonance, even as they are a real counterfeit that do not do justice to people. Helping people find purpose in their suffering. Peter, now, how have we seen the church, which knows this so well, respond to, respond to this progression of medical aid and dying laws in Canada? When the uh, first legislative initiative uh, was put forward back in 2016, the, the church was really aggressive. I watched Cardinal Collins at one of the one of the hearings, and he was absolutely phenomenal. The even the Quebec bishops, who tend to be very very shy about getting involved in public uh, brouhaha's, put out some very very strong statements. Um, since then, the the church has 
it's been it realized that the the fight that it's in, and I think it's gone into a more uh, quiet mode, uh, trying to, to to keep the faithful, as Amanda just said, keep the faithful active in it rather than it kind of being the voice of the church from above. But um, I was at the the Cardinals' dinner last winter in uh, in, in Toronto, and Cardinal Collins um, in front of thirteen hundred people. He was giving his talk, a, talk, a general talk, and then he started talking about euthanasia and MAID, and he just looked at everybody and he said, what have we become? Mm. What have we become? And he sent those 1,300 people out of that room with that message ringing in their ears. And and I think it, you know, it, there's a percolating effect there where it does galvanize, again, as Amanda has said, it galvanizes the pro-life movement. But man, this is an uphill struggle or, or you know, from swimming against the tide, whatever metaphor we want to use. This has just taken off in Canada and to fight back against it. The, the church is doing all what it can, I think. Uh, um, but boy, oh boy, it's it's tough. You've got the force of government against you. Amanda, MAID is also piquing an interest of funeral homes and businesses, offering rooms where assisted suicide can be administered by a professional, your family can be there, you can design your own experience. Is this a fad or a trend? There's a sense in which euthanasia kind of goes along with a social media culture that would want to curate all of the moments of life to be perfect, picture perfect. But life's not like that. We know that life is messy. And when we reflect on the moments that are deepest and most intimate, they're usually the ones that we don't broadcast or tweet about. And if you think about being at the bedside of a dying person, no one thinks about taking out their camera to live stream it. So I think this is a call for us to reflect on what is the true nature of intimacy and presence? And how can we cherish those moments that we're not always being broadcast as we live our lives on social media, but that nevertheless make us deeply human and are worth savoring. Peter, we've talked about some of these actors that are in play here. The United Nations human rights experts have expressed concern that euthanasia is being given to patients with non-terminal illnesses and found the laws discriminatory to those with disabilities. What can you tell us about whether this actually has weight? I know that the UN hasn't been great on abortion and other life issues. Right. In fact, um, not only the UN, but the actual board that oversees made and euthanasia here in Quebec, where I, where I live, has said, "Whoa, whoa, wait a minute! There, there are people who are way outside the bounds, and they're receiving it. Seven percent of deaths in Quebec now are as a result of made. So, the, you know, the UN. I mean, it's it's kind of top down, but right here on the ground, people are simply ignoring it. And as I said earlier, this has become." Uh, just people are understanding this as just a way to leave their leave life. Um, and so, you know, the UN can add its voice to that. But when our own regulatory bodies and, and uh, you know, whatever politicians are involved can't control it, I don't give much hope to the, uh, to the UN to being able to influence uh, public opinion right. either. Right, when you've got the force of the prime minister against you. Well, Amanda, you get the last word really quickly. What actions should pro-life organizations do to combat this issue, the laity? Well, I'm so pleased to share that tomorrow I'm organizing a day-long event in my home diocese where I was born and raised, Diocese of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. And the theme of the day is the church as an expert in humanity. This was a term that uh, Pope used when he addressed the United Nations. Paul VI used this and said, we come here as an expert in humanity. And so this is about instilling the church with confidence that we are actually prepared to meet the crises of our time, of loneliness, grief mental illness, we're prepared to meet them through ministry, accompaniment, and our confidence in the power of God to overcome even death. So we're going to have a morning ministry fair of all the exhibits that, uh, of all the ministries that are doing the best work around these areas of end of life to celebrate and affirm the good work we're doing in the church already. And then we're going to have an afternoon of panels and then an evening of testimonies with seven different speakers from the community addressing the real issues in the church um, so that they can speak in the presence of the bishop uh, as echoes of the seven last words of Christ. The church is an expert in humanity, and we have reasons to be confident about, confident about that. Absolutely. That's a galvanizing call and one that we hope that other dioceses and other churches will pick up uh, to following your example. Thank you both for this important conversation. Thank you. We continue this discussion after the break with a closer look at how euthanasia laws in Canada impact the disabled, the poor, and the marginalized communities. Plus... Refugees are survivors, and uh, when they come to our country, 
Uh, we just need to show them love and respect for the human dignity. Understanding the plight of the refugee, we tell you about a little book the Pope hopes you will read. Let's talk about the children. Yes. We're here, <laughs> and obviously this, you actually had interactions with one of them. We visit the Blue Army Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima to speak to the nun investigating the cause of the venerable Sister Lucia of the Fatima apparitions. EWTN News In-Depth will be right back. I continue to see this movement as one of the great threats because the right to die is a right the poor will get, that the disabled will get. We will help them die instead of helping them live, helping them have a, an acceptable quality of life uh, with our disabled, with the mentally ill, getting them treatment and services. A right to die or a right to live? Pro-life advocates are sounding the alarm on assisted suicide laws in Canada and the potential that they could be used to target the poor and marginalized. As we've been discussing in this program, Canada is on track for the highest rate of medically assisted suicides in the world. It's a trend that has UN experts, pro-life experts and ethics professionals voicing great concern. Marketed as a way to avoid pain, at its core it takes away the sanctity of life. In in March of next year, the laws in Canada will expand to allow those with mental illnesses to request the procedure. Two leaders in the fight against assisted suicide laws, Matt Vallier, the president of the Patients' Rights Action Fund, and Amy Hasbrook, director of Toujours Vivant, Not Dead Yet in Canada, join us now to talk about these expanding laws in Canada. Matt, this issue has created quite a coalition of strange bedfellows fighting for the right to stay alive. What has been your experience and who's a part of this coalition? So for us, you know, we're a secular nonpartisan organization in great part to bring together those disparate and very broad based coalitions. So they range from left to right, secular to religious. So you'll have um, progressive disability rights organizations and individuals as well as uh, medical professionals, ethics folks. You have bioethicists in addition to uh, people who advocate on behalf of Latinos and other minorities, while at the same time going holding hands with various uh, stripes of religion, um, from Christian to Jewish and Muslim and even Hindus, um, opposing assisted suicide laws alongside of even people who uh, are atheist, and all because this is not really um, an issue that kind of springs forth from somebody's worldview. Uh, it's not a right-left issue. This is a human being issue. And none of us in the opposition want to see people being coerced. That's where we see these laws um, putting pressure on people to choose death over care and creating a two-tiered system of medicine that results in death to the devalued group. Choosing death over care, well said. Amy, you're on the ground there. You're with Not Dead Yet. Why is this so important for disability advocates? It's important because um, even though pro-euthanasia people claim that it's about people at the end of life, we know that that's not the case. 30 years ago, Tracy Latimer, who was a 12-year-old girl with cerebral palsy, was killed by her father. And there was a great outpouring of support for her father, not for Tracy, but for her father, who killed her because he decided that she was suffering too much even though in fact she wasn't suffering she had there were other medical interventions that could have come along and so the council of canadians with disabilities undertook to try to educate the public about the lives of disabled people and why people with disabilities need to be valued unfortunately that is not the way things turned out and in um though there were several proposed bills that would have uh, legalized assisted suicide and euthanasia. Um, the Supreme Court in 2015 decided that um, despite an earlier decision that said that um, the law that prohibited assisted suicide would protect people and that that was a legitimate uh, goal, the the court decided that um, it violated people's statutory rights to s liberty and security of the person. We believe that disabled people, as the people who are all 
um, every person who requests and receives assisted suicide and euthanasia has a disability. And so disabled people, whether or not they consider themselves disabled, are at primary risk and need to be identified as such. Absolutely, and those on the front lines to identify them in that way are medical professionals. What kind of pressure are medical professionals in Canada receiving from government regulators or from their accreditation boards? Well, there's a lot of pressure. Um, just in June, um, when our province, Quebec, had originally adopted its euthanasia law, uh, palliative care services were ex were allowed to uh, refuse to provide euthanasia, but the province just changed its law to uh, remove that uh, exemption. So it forces palliative care services, hospices, et cetera, to provide euthanasia if somebody requests it on their premises. And I am also working on a practice guideline that was issued in March quietly by the health by Health Canada, which um, loosens and further rescinds several of the protections that are supposed to be in the law without benefit of the uh, parliamentary process. An undemocratic way of getting that uh, passed through. Matt, then what are the options for medical professionals who face these pressures, regulatory and otherwise? So it's it's hard to to navigate a system where the thing is is topsy turvy. You have medical professionals accusing uh, the ones who don't want to participate of being not compassionate when what they would like them to provide is death to their patients. In a scenario where the Canadian government and the other entities and uh, jurisdictions where assisted suicide is legalized. Uh, the pressure to contain costs is immense on doctors. Mm. And so they they need to band together and take legal action, as happened here um, in the US. There are a couple of uh, lawsuits that occurred, one in California, one in New Mexico, and now in, um, in Colorado as well, where doctors are pushing back on these states that have passed laws that require them to participate as simply an an ethical standard. You have right. to give doctors their conscience. That's exactly on that, right. So that, so that patients can have a choice. If you have a regime wherein people only have an option to go to a place where assisted suicide will be practiced, they can't rest assured that their medical professionals are not going to devalue their lives. And that's what many people with disabilities face in the medical setting. That's right. Well, Amy, let's talk about that legal action very quickly. We only have a minute left. In the U.S., we're seeing legal action to protect those who are disabled from laws that would limit access to care. Is there something similar happening in Canada, or is there no legal advocacy happening? There is some legal advocacy on the on the horizon. Um, there is there is an idea that we could uh, pursue the the Supreme Court decision that was issued in 2015, which said that a carefully designed system uh, would apply stringent limits that would be uh, scrupulously monitored and enforced. And that is what was supposed to happen. And our argument is that that is not what's happening. You also are, um, since Canada is a signatory to the con Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We're also pursuing an investigation, a possible investigation under the UNCRPD. Well, that's important work. Matt, what is quickly the status of the U.S. case in California where disability advocates are challenging California regulations that coerces those with disabilities into using medical aid and dying rather than seeking care? So a lawsuit was filed in April to challenge uh, the assisted suicide law as inherently discriminatory, an ADA violation and a uh, violation of the Constitution. If that law, if that lawsuit is successful, um, it would overturn the California law. Um, yet to be determined, the judge uh, will be coming out with preliminary judgments on motions to dismiss, and we'll see if we'll be able to continue that case and make headway in pushing back on this insidious an inherently discriminatory public policy. Well, we'll be praying for that case, and Amy will be praying for your good work. Thank you both. Thank you.
to learn Thank more you, about Monse. the work that Matt and Amy are doing in their fight to protect patients, you can visit PatientsRightsActionFund.org and NotDeadYet.org. Top headlines next in the Week in Review. Ukrainian President Zelensky at the United Nations and the White House. Pope Francis travels to speak about migrants in the Mediterranean. And the Holy Father's book recommendation about a refugee's odyssey when we return. A historic visit to the United Nations tops our week in review. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky met with world leaders in New York on Tuesday, warning that a Russian victory could amount to World War III. President Joe Biden also made a robust case before the U.N. General Assembly for continued support of Ukraine. Mr. Biden said Russia is counting on the world to grow tired of the prolonged conflict, saying no nation will be secure if the rest of the world allows Ukraine to be carved up. In his remarks, Zelensky said Russia is weaponizing everything from food and energy production to the abduction of Ukrainian children taken to Russia. And we are trying to get children back home. But time, time goes by. What will happen with them? What will happen to them? Those children in Russia are taught to hate Ukraine. And all ties with their families are broken. And this is clearly a genocide. When hatred is weaponized against one nation, it never stops there. Zelensky also attended a meeting of the UN Security Council in which he called for a complete withdrawal of all Russian troops from Ukraine and reform of the Security Council's structure in which Russia has the veto power to block the UN's toughest measures. Zelensky made a quick trip to Washington on Thursday to try to shore up U.S. support and aid for the war. He delivered an upbeat message on the war's progress in meetings with congressional leaders at the U.S. Capitol while answering some tough questions about how he plans to win the counteroffensive against Russian forces. Some Republicans are increasingly opposed to spending more money to Ukraine. Zelensky reportedly told senators, if we don't get the aid, we will lose the war. Later in meetings at the White House, President Biden said he's counting on Congress to make a good judgment about continued funding for Ukraine, saying there's no alternative. Since the beginning of the war, most members of Congress have supported approving $113 billion in aid for the war effort against Russian aggression, though there is now increasing pushback. In their meetings Thursday, the president told Zelensky the U.S. is committed to supporting a just and lasting peace that respects Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Five American hostages detained for years in Iran arrived home Tuesday, hugged their loved ones, and shouted freedom after the Biden administration brokered a deal to release $6 billion in frozen Iranian assets. The longest imprisoned hostage was held for eight years. Critics of the monetary arrangement expressed dismay at Iran's ability to access its funds, though the money, to be held in restricted accounts in Qatar, will only be released for humanitarian expenditures like medicine and food. Despite those opposed to the deal, families of the hostages expressed extreme gratitude. Real hero of this story, surviving eight years of brutal treatment, but never, never losing hope. And, and, and showing what happens when you're hopeful, when you fight. And we're grateful for this moment, really. And, and, and we're going to start building our lives again. In exchange for the five released Americans, the U.S. released five Iranian prisoners held in the U.S. on charges ranging from obtaining military equipment to illegally exporting technologies. Some of them are permanent residents of the U.S., and after their release, two chose to remain in America rather than to return to Iran. We're following developments in the Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan, where a ceasefire continues to hold at the time we are taping this broadcast. The region that is internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan is self-governed by some 120,000 ethnic Armenians. Historically, it was once part of Armenia. Since December of 2022, Azerbaijan has formed a blockade on the main road, cutting off supplies of food and medicine to the region. 
Recent skirmishes erupted into full-fledged fighting on Tuesday when Azerbaijan's military launched attacks that its government describes as anti-terrorist operations. Dozens of civilians were killed before Karabakh forces agreed to surrender to Azerbaijan. Many Armenian civilians are being housed by Russian peacekeeping forces. Azerbaijan now intends to bring the breakaway region under full control. Leaders there have also said they will be delivering food and medical supplies to the population there on Friday. Pope Francis arrived in the French city of Marseille on Friday to take part in the conclusion of the Mediterranean meetings. The eighth day event invites young people, clergy and all organizations or actors of goodwill to take part and promote positive initiatives throughout the region. The main focus is talks held by bishops from across the Mediterranean discussing solutions to challenges facing coastal Mediterranean communities, including the economy, religious plurality, and immigration. The plight of the immigrant is a cornerstone of Pope Francis's papacy. Whether that be in the Mediterranean or elsewhere in the world, Francis has urged understanding. In fact, he's mentioned a book he wants his bishops to read, one you could too, to provide insight into a refugee's odyssey. Here's reporter Catherine Hadro. Pope Francis's first pastoral visit outside of Rome was in July 2013 to a little-known Mediterranean island called Lampedusa. Known as Italy's Ellis Island, it's a primary destination for migrants from Africa seeking entry into Europe. There, he celebrated mass on an altar converted from an immigrant's boat and remembered the more than 20,000 people who had already died trying to reach the island. It was a clear signal that Pope Francis's concern for migrants would be at the center of his pontificate. Now, 10 years later, the Holy Father is continuing to make that known, this time with a book recommendation. He's now mentioned in papal plane pressers, TV news interviews, and beyond. Hermanito, or Little Brother, A Refugee's Odyssey, is the book Pope Francis has cited multiple times offering insight into one of his papal priorities. It recounts the true story of Ibrima Balde, a boy who left Guinea to search for his brother, suffering slavery, imprisonment, and torture along the way. It's a sobering look into a refugee's journey with reflections like this one. We saw so many bodies along the way, some in the desert, others in the sea. The dead remain there. We keep on moving. That's the only difference. Pope Francis reportedly gave the book to Italy's bishops this year, telling them, read it. You will see the drama, the drama of a migrant on the shores of Libya. Pope Francis, uh, when he talks about that book and also throughout his message, it, it's just a caring for the human life. Aidan Batar is a Muslim refugee from Somalia. He and his young family fled to Kenya when the Somali civil war broke out and they resettled in the U.S. in 1994 becoming the first family from Somalia to settle in Utah through Catholic Community Services, where he now serves as director of Migration and Refugee Services. Like the book Little Brother, Batar brings his personal perspective into the refugee crisis the Holy Father frequently spotlights. People will take whatever mode of travel that they can, whether it would be the road, or the sea, and whatever, you know, way that they could leave that because there are, you know, people chasing them, killing them, uh, torturing them. The Somalian refugee hopes the faithful will take a page out of Pope Francis's own book. Uh, the Pope is uh, encouraging uh, people throughout the world to, to, to help, to serve this, uh, uh, you know, individuals that are fleeing their home countries and to welcome them, uh, to show them the love and respect that they deserve. Catherine Hadro, EWTN News, in depth. We'll be right back. How do pastors and lay people, you know, discern together, listen together, communicate together in the daily life of the church? What does that look like? The great conversation that is about to begin. We explain the Synod on Synodality and the Pope's vision for the future of the church when we return.
In about two weeks, bishops, clergy, and laity will gather for the Synod on Synodality. It's an event we've been telling you about from its many angles in our Synodal series for months now. While it's a global church initiative, there are many Catholics who still don't understand what it is. Mark Irons breaks it down for us. If you're Catholic, maybe you've heard about a synod taking place in the church, but then again... Are you familiar with this? No. Maybe not. Uh, Have you heard of the synod? I've heard of it, but I'm not too, really too familiar. If you aren't too familiar with the synod, maybe you've only heard this. It sounds a bit controversial to me. But for starters, a synod is not new. A synod is a consultative body of bishops and others... Dr. John Grabowski, a professor of moral theology at the Catholic University of America, explains synods, regular meetings of bishops, began occurring every few years following the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s. There was such a positive experience at the council of bishops coming together from all over the world and working together and teaching together that they wanted to capture some of that lightning in a bottle. Throughout the years, different topics have been discussed at these meetings. In 2015, Grabowski was invited to Rome as an expert to contribute in the Synod on the Family. The current Synod is focused on the very idea of synodality itself and what that means for everyone in the everyday life of the Church. Grabowski says throughout his papacy, Pope Francis has spoken about the need for synodality defined in this way. Everyone walking together. Everyone in the church, the bishop of Rome, the bishops, the clergy, the laity, everyone, the faithful walking together, right? We're, we're on a pilgrimage together. A synod is an opportunity for the church's teachers and pastors to not just teach, but to listen and to hear about the concerns. And this current synod on synodality isn't a one-time event. It started in 2021 and is playing out in multiple phases. It began at a local parish level and included hopes and concerns of Catholic laity throughout the world compiled into reports. All that information has been condensed into a current working document by the Vatican. It has a technical Latin name, the Instrumentum Laboris, but it's not an authoritative document on church teaching. Instead, it highlights a number of suggestions and questions for prayer and reflection that could serve as a framework for discussion at the next phase of the Synod, an October Assembly of Bishops and Laity in Rome. It states the Synodal Assembly of October 2023 will be asked to listen deeply to the situations in which the church lives and carries out its mission. Real concerns of the church will be addressed, like evangelization and the need for active participation among the laity in the life of the church. The working document says there is a clear call to overcome a vision that reserves any active function in the church to ordained ministers alone. That idea isn't new either, but it may need a fresh look. One of the things the Second Vatican Council did was to say we need to pay more attention not just to the, the hierarchy and to religious life, but to the lay, the lay vocation of the faithful, which is the majority of the church. So what about that synod controversy some might refer to? I'm a little leery about, you know, whether things are becoming too liberal within the church. A few things are different about this synod. Though bishops will still make up the majority, lay participants in Rome will have the ability to vote. And some of the questions for reflection in the Instrumentum Laboris include topics that may be more relevant for Catholic Church consideration today than they were 60 years ago, such as what concrete steps are needed to welcome those who feel excluded from the Church because of their status or sexuality. For example, remarried divorcees, people in polygamous marriages, LGBTQ plus people, etc. But keep in mind, a question like that, though it may get more attention in some media coverage, is not the focus of the Synod. If you are familiar with the synod taking place in the Catholic Church, it's possible you've heard of one or two things that could be discussed, but the truth is there's a whole lot more to pay attention to. What about incorporating vulnerable members of society into the life of the church? The working synod document states, there are widespread reports of a variety of practical and cultural barriers that exclude persons with disabilities, which must be overcome. And how about beyond serving the poor, how can the poor better serve within the church? The question put forth, quote, what efforts have been made to welcome the voice of the poorest and to integrate their contribution? The needed contributions of migrants, youth, and women are also considered. The working document says women play a major role in transmitting the faith. How can we better recognize, support, and accompany their already considerable contribution? With all these questions, Dr. Grabowski advises against jumping to conclusions before the Senate is over, which won't wrap up until the final consultation of bishops in Rome next year. And even then, the final Synod report would have to be reviewed and approved by the Pope first, who could decide what, if any, of the findings should be incorporated into church teaching.
Grabowski warns against heated social media rhetoric and divisive public speculation about what yeah. that might be. Put the hype aside for a while and let's see what actually comes out of this in terms of what's finally taught as the fruit of this synod. Instead, Grabowski says pray for the ongoing synod. He notes the importance of synodality, the Holy Spirit uniting all members of the church in the mission of the church to spread the gospel and bring Christ to all people. It's a mission for the laity to embrace alongside the clergy. Synodality is focusing on uh, the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit uh, animates the entire body of Christ. At the Pontifical North American College in Rome, where future members of the clergy are formed, synodality is practiced. Father Anthony Legato, assistant vice rector at the college, says listening to the Holy Spirit is crucial as each seminarian, with the guidance of the formation team, discerns a call to the priesthood. We're always continuing to discern, even within the formation process itself, how is Christ calling us? The Synod working document raises this question, how can seminaries and houses of formation be reformed so that they form candidates for ordained ministry who will develop a manner of exercising authority that is appropriate to a synodal church? For religious or lay members of the church, Father Legato says being led by the Holy Spirit and working together in the church, having synodality, begins with silence and prayer. Surrendering ourselves to Jesus Christ. Uh, to continually seeking what the Lord's will is for us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's echoing a vital point made by Pope Francis. The Holy Father officially kicked off the Synod in 2021, adding these words. The Synod is not a parliament or an opinion poll. The Synod is an ecclesial event, and its protagonist is the Holy Spirit. If the Spirit is not present, there will be no Synod. Mark Irons, EWTN News in Depth. The Synod on Synodality begins the first week of October. EWTN News will have full coverage on our broadcast programs, as well as the Catholic News Agency and the National Catholic Register. Sister, she can read souls. So I was like, oh no, I went to confession, <laughs> just in case. Inspiration for our faith from the nun leading the cause of canonization of one of the three children of Fatima. We share her wisdom next. One does not have to travel to Portugal to experience the message of Our Lady of Fatima. In the United States near Asbury, New Jersey is a beautiful and peaceful setting for prayer and meditation at the Blue Army Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima. The American Shrine is a tribute to the one in Fatima, Portugal, where three young children saw apparitions of the Angel of Peace and Our Blessed Mother in the years 1916 and 1917. And it is to the Blue Army Shrine where we traveled earlier this month. Pilgrims come to this place west of New York City to worship Our Lady and remember the young shepherd children to whom Mary appeared, asking them to pray the rosary daily for world peace. Two of the children were canonized in 2017 on the 100-year anniversary of the first apparition of Our Lady of Fatima. They died of influenza as children. The third child, their cousin, Lucia, went on to become a religious sister and lived until age 97. She is now a venerable, and we spoke to the postulator overseeing the cause of canonization for Sister Lucia at the Blue Army Shrine, a nun and world-renowned expert and speaker on the messages of Our Lady of Fatima. Sister Angela de Fatima Coelho, it's such a joy to be here with you in this incredible shrine, the Blue Army Shrine here in New Jersey, dedicated to Our Lady of Fatima and these wonderful children who experienced a relationship with her in a way. And you are their postulator. <laughs> That's a big yes. word. Can you explain what it means to be a postulator, to be called in that way? Okay, a postulator is a sort of a lawyer that represents a candidate to sanctity in front of the church. So I represented the cause of Saints Francisco and Jacinta since they were blessed until they were canonized. And now I am the vice postulator for the servant of God, Lucia. That means I represent her cause since 2014. Wow, and you were called to this pretty early. Yes, it was in 2009 by the Bishop of Fatima. I was still very young and it was like a challenging mission, but I took with joy and at the same time with a sense of responsibility. And this, this uh, role that you've taken on has also then allowed you to have roles within the church. Um, you have a role uh, within the Office of, of, of Postulants, right? Yes. And you're the first woman to have that kind of a role. 
Well, I am one among other women being this work of postulator, even though we are not a lot of women doing that, mostly men. Uh, and uh, I am like the link, or those who are postulators, Roman postulators, are the link between the causes and the dicasterium for the causes of the saints, Beautiful. which is um, a challenge and an honor to work within the Vatican and for the Vatican in such a tight connection. When we've seen this beautiful uh, transformation of the coming together of male and female complementarity at the Vatican recently with Pope Francis and the way that he's called women into the church in this way, has, have you experienced a change in this dynamic? Has this been life-giving for you? You know, being a sister in my order, Alianza de Santa Maria, I have to be honest, I never felt that we were not respected, mm. uh, being sisters. But of course, after 2009, when I was nominated vice postulator and eventually postulator, I could see that I was doing something that I think like 50 years ago would be impossible. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it is a challenge, but I think it's, it's coming. And yes, Pope Francis' will is this one. So I think I'm part of it and I'm very happy for that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable to see and to see how you carry it out with such grace. Let's talk about the children. Yes. We're here <laughs> and obviously this, you actually had interactions with one of them. So the first two who died at 10 years old of the Spanish flu, they had experiences with Our Lady, the three of them, they were able to see and hear her respectively. Yes. Um, but Sister Lucia, was able to have conversations with her and you spoke to her five times. Yes. What was that like? Well, that was one of the greatest graces of my life, I have to admit. The first time, especially, I was not expecting. Father Condor, my predecessor in the cause of the Shepherd Children, told me, Sister Angela, tomorrow we'll visit Sister Lucia. <laughs> and I was so excited because I was going to see the woman that saw the Blessed Mother and the one who experienced what is going to be the charisma of my order, so the charisma of my life. Yes. I was so enthusiastic. Father Condor teased me a little bit. He said, sister, she can read souls. So I was like, oh no, I went to confession, <laughs> just in case. You went to confession, I well, love that. Well, the next day when I saw her, I, I could see she was not seeing souls, at, at least for what I could understand. But what really touched me was her uh, way of being so normal. She was worried and concerned and asking questions about my daily simple life. Um, at the same time, her sense of humor, her joy. And I could see, even though she was elderly, how sharp she was, how intelligent she was. And uh, after reading her diary and the letters, I can recognize all of these virtues. The simplicity. She always felt herself as an instrument, so she never felt as a special woman in, in any point. Her great sense of humor, teasing about herself and the circumstances, which was for me a great example. And when you had these opportunities to be with her, she's, she was elderly at that point. Yes. Um, she passed away at 97 years old, is that right? Yes, 2005. Right, and so you had an opportunity to be with her while she was still lucid and had memories of Our Lady. Did she ever talk to you about that? Well, since 1955, she was not able to talk about the message of Fatima. Under prudence and also to protect her, the Holy See, the decree, those norms that would not allow Sister Lucia to speak. But when I met her was after the year 2000 when the third part of the secret was published. Yes. It was more easy for her to speak. It, nevertheless, she was very silent about the events. But one, one thing uh, impressed me. In one of these five times I went with someone from the United States who asked her to pray for some graces to ask for her intercession. And she, her constant answer was, yes, I'll pray, but you too, you pray the rosary every day. And when this gentleman was asking for something else, she would say, yes, I, I will pray, but you too, you pray the rosary every day. And you know, that touched my heart. I, I remember to think, this woman knows more than I do. And if she's insisting in praying the rosary every day, she, she knows why. So I, I, I kept praying my rosary with more deep confidence in the Immaculate Heart of Mary intercession. Oh, that's beautiful. Now I know that for us, um, I had the opportunity obviously to prepare for this interview, but <laughs> our audience might not know the beauty of what was given to these children and what, what Our Lady's coming to, to them, uh, what they received. So can you tell me, you've written about this, yes. tell me about the secrets of Fatima. <laughs> well, I think the greatest secret of Fatima, it's that our Lord loves us mm. deeply and that he wants us to love him back. So this desire of God 
of us being aware that he wants a relationship with us. And that in order for that relationship to go deeper, he offers us a mother, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, as our sh shelter, our refuge, and our way to him. But um, in order also to establish this relationship with the Blessed Mother, she offers how to do it, the prayer of the rosary. And we, when we are in a deep relationship with God, through Our Lady, through the prayer of the rosary, we understand that we live not only for ourselves, but for the history of salvation and of peace in the world. So I can tell you that Fatima offers her a rock where we can establish our life, God. Mm. So the call to adoration offers her as a mother, the Blessed Mother, a family, the church, because part of the third part of the secret is the mystery of the church and offer us a meaning for life. We are here to cooperate in the history of salvation and peace in the world. Peace in the world is something that we are so desperate for yes. and, and we're praying for it. We hear the Holy Father talking about it. And it's one of the things that he went to Fatima specifically to pray about right before World Youth Day. Before World Youth Day, you gave a beautiful interview about what, you ex what your expectations and hopes were for people to encounter Portugal in general, yes. but also the beauty of this, this wonderful homecoming for Our Lady um, with these children. Now that that's behind us, yes. how do you think that encounter will change the world? Well, I think it is impossible for a young man or a woman that went to Fatima and Portugal, Lisbon, and experienced the meeting with the Holy Father, the meeting of one, more than one million young adults mm -hmm. experienced the same events, adoration, and also most of them also went to Fatima. I think it's impossible to go back the same way. So uh, the seeds that were planted there, I am sure with the grace of the Holy Spirit will flourish, especially the unity in the church. You were there, people from all over the world, young adults, bishops, consecrated people, all together with the Holy Father, praying for peace in the world. And I think this is a great challenge for our church today. Uh, and there is a challenge that the message of Fatima gives to each one of us. And the challenge that, um, how can I say, Sister Lucia, in her long life, lived deeply and prayed for the unity of the, of the church. So the priests with the bishops, the bishops with the Pope, it's so simple. And uh, nevertheless, it is difficult in these times. And this is one of the calls of, of Fatima for us. And I am sure the, those young adults who went through Fatima experienced that call in the personal meeting they had with the Blessed Mother. At least I hope that. The richness of the eternal church, absolutely. And that, that's really what I wanted to hear from you is from the secrets of Fatima for a time such as this, we're living in times of division, confusion, um, and we're about to enter into a moment of discernment with the Synod. The synod? This is a very significant moment that lasts not just this year, but through next year. How can Our Lady of Fatima be this place of rest and consolation for those who are uneasy? You know, in the third part of the secret, we see a pilgrimage of people, lay people, consecrated, you know, all ages, all conditions in life. Mm -hmm. And this pilgrimage was led by the bishop dressed in white, by the Pope. And they were walking through a city, half in ruins, climbing a steep mountain in the top of which was the cross. Why do you know it's the Catholic Church? because it's the Pope. If you take away the Pope, can be any group of our brothers and sisters that follow Christ. Yes. But you know it's the Catholic Church because of the Pope. They were walking through a city half in ruins. We know the times are not easy. The ruins symbolize that. It's a challenging moment also because of that. The, the pathway is hard. It is a steep mountain, hard to climb. But in the end of it, we have the source of our strength, Jesus in the cross, but we have our leader, the Pope. So let us trust. The Holy Spirit will always be with the church. And uh, I am sure, I know all of us experienced the times of confusion. That's why we need more and more to be clear to whom we shall look, we shall look upon. Yes. And I think it's the Holy Father. You will lead us to the cross with the Blessed Mother. And I think she came to Fatima uh, 100 years ago, also to, to, with this message, message for today. 
Yes, 106 years ago. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing how time in the church just doesn't exist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or maybe it does, right? Right, in a different way. Um, my last question for you is just about your personal vocation. Oh. <laughs> you, you do these incredible things. You're called into the church in roles of leadership, in roles of servant leadership. Yes. To build up the cause of saints. Um, how did you come to know Christ in this way where you, we can see it on your face? Well, uh, first of all, it's a gift from God and from our Lord. It's not me. Um, it, was a, it was also hard. I mean, uh, I remember being a child and willing to be a doctor and a, a sister. I went through the normal process of discernment with a spiritual director, uh, my mother superior of my order, but they always uh, taught me something, um, the importance of prayer life. Mm -hmm. Without Eucharistic adoration, without the rosary, without reflection on the gospel, your heart will never be open, so the Holy Spirit work on you. So uh, even when I was in those moments of really tough, when it was tough to follow Christ this way, I hold on to that, Eucharist, rosary, and the gospel. And that led me to this, to this place that I am now. All the rest is the grace of our Lord. So I'm just very blessed, I'm very, honor to be a member of the church with the role that I having and I really feel the responsibility to be faithful uh, because that's what I think our world needs more. People committed where their vocations saying yes to Jesus even when we feel like saying no. Yes. <laughs> but just because we said yes, we have to be faithful to that. And, and Sister Lucia struggled with that as well. So we've got two saints yes. that you've been a part of, Jacinta and Francisco. Yes. And then Sister Lucia, who is venerable, ven venerable now. Venerable. Right. So she started as servant of God, servant of God now venerable, venerable and hopefully beatified canonized and, and canonized. And then we need one miracle. So this part of the process until now, it's like the first phase. Mm -hmm. It's to, to arrive to this decree of heroicity of virtue. So the Holy Father, June 22nd, gave permission to pu publish the decree of heroic virtues. That means she According to what we study, the church, the church study, we can say that she practiced the virtues in an heroic grade. So being like an example. Yes. Now we need our Lord to say yes. Yes, she did. So that is the miracle. And I encourage everybody who is listening to us now to, to pray you through her pray. intercession for a miracle for the beatification and then another one for the canonization. And that's the part that we get to be a part of. We get to join you in this really yes. exciting moment in prayer. So thank you yes. for the call and for the message. You are this welcome. Is, it's a beautiful time with you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you for the invitation. And that's it for this edition of EWTN News In Depth. We hope to see you again next week for more news and reports important to your Catholic life. See you then.